You know, I, uh, I tweeted earlier, I don't tweet very much about the meeting, and, and what I said was, I struggle at these meetings that, that often I see technology searching for problems, but not well-defined problems searching for solutions. And I, I think it characterizes much of the weaknesses of our market that we don't live in a world where if you have evidence or ways of making patients better that you can clearly make money, regardless of the solution. And I, and, and I want to talk a little bit about a way of beginning to create convergence in that and some thoughts on that. So uh, this is my brother Stephen. Uh, it was about four, three or four years after he was diagnosed. He couldn't walk um, and he's in a pool because his legs can't bear weight and he likes being in the pool. And I like the image of him and what he was thinking about in this question, which I think is really goes to the heart of what we're trying to do in medicine. Given my status, what is the best outcome I can hope to achieve and how do I get there? The reason I think the question is critical is I think we fail to answer all of the elements of it. I think that we do not understand the status of patients at almost any level, um, with the exception of a very small number of diseases that we tend to talk about as if we have knowledge. Um, we certainly don't understand the range of outcomes and make them accessible to the people involved or communicate them in any formal systems way that an engineer would recognize. We tell a lot of stories. Poetry sometimes is what I think medicine is. Um, but we don't actually use data to drive care or models in that context in a very serious way. And the last part is the journey is sort of driven by these commercial enterprises and concerns and not the holistic way of thinking about the patient's life. And this consistent failure to define and deliver this question really drives much of the disruptions in the market that those of us that are here, and there are amazing transformative ideas that can help us understand disease, that are all seeking a market that is effective. And I would argue that the patient is the way to get that. So let's look at how we do research now. So this is a study that was done in ALS in uh, 2008 that, that, that looked at lithium carbonate and reliazole, two treatments together. And it was studied in two groups, a treatment and a control group, at, at moderately great expense. And here is this grid of questions that we asked of the patients that the people that ran the study had to pay people to answer, even though anyone doing clinical care should know the answer to these questions. But you had to pay someone to answer these questions to determine which group did better. And if you do this well, you get a result that looks like this. This is a great study. If you're a patient, you want to be in the blue line. After a decade of working in ALS, this was an extremely important finding and, quite frankly, changed the way the disease was treated for a few years. Now let's contrast to care. So here's my brother, he's seeing his doctor, who's, by the way, a wonderful human being, came to the house, did house visits, all of the wonderful human things doctors did. But this is a note about his care, which has zero, close to zero computable value. Doesn't say what kind of FVC was measured, doesn't say, because you have to specific to the institution. None of this information really can become something meaningful in predicting Stephen's outcome. And yet we spend hundreds of dollars on every one of these visits and produce nothing that will benefit any human being in the future. And I would argue that the way to change that is to begin to think about engaging the patients in this. These two systems, clinical research and clinical care, are completely separate. And all of the amazing ideas, and we can all do the math, multiplex them. How many genes, how many treatments, how many drugs, how many patients, how many diseases do we redefine? will not be solved by a clinical research system that is independent of the clinical care system. So this is our solution to this problem. Um, patients Like Me is a website where you can go and you can find patients. Um, we have about 125,000 patients with about 50 different disorders that we've built out. You can see here ALS, HIV, um, uh, a Rett syndrome. Um, uh, and other patients. I'm going to search here and search for MS patients. There's 26,000 of them. Males between 35 and, say, 50 years old. I'm going to stick with that for another couple of years. Um, and, uh, and then I want patients that are not newly diagnosed. So they've had disease at least three years. Less than 10, though, not a long time. But more than that, I want people that are actually on the verge of not being able to work, that have the same disability as me. So I'll go here and I'll look, OK, so it's not a condition status under an outcome in lab. Maybe a MSRS, which is a rating scale, somewhere between 20 and 50, which means I'm still pretty functional, but I'm having trouble working. And I'm going to find that there are 300 members just like me in the system. And here's one of them. There's a social, mental, and physical well-being, a guy named Runecrest, who's 38. 
Um, I, he has cognition impairment, vision impairment, speech impairment. And if I go and look at him, because I want to really look at his profile, I can see what this is like. By the way, you can do this, not logged in. So just go and join the site and look at it. And you can see his status over the last two years in this MSRS, just like a stock chart, expandable, contractible. This is functionally how well he is in every sort of month or so. Quality of life, his treatments Gantt charted against his goals. He's managing GERD and um, hyperthyroidism, a depressed mood. His symptomology, if I look at the entire a shorter timeline where I can see the density of the data, this is how much data we have over the last two years in this individual. Data on his pain, how he manages it, data on his anxious mood. And if I click through to this to look at what I can learn when I aggregate up this group of people, I'll see data on roughly 50,000 people's current anxiety, how they treat it. But I'm not interested in everyone. I'm interested in MS patients. So I could filter that for MS patients only. So we'll refilter that just to the MS patients, probably be a number about 10,000. Well, looks like 15,000 or so MS patients, current anxious mood, the treatments they use for it. And if I drill in one of those treatments, like clonopin, I can now look at 3,000 patients' worth of data how well it's rated to solve each of the issues that it's solved by the patients, the side effects of the drug, the doses they take, information that's not available to anyone else, how long they've been on it, and how much they pay for it. All because the patients exchanged open this data in an open system, because the clinical system doesn't record the data in a way that anyone can use it. So the patients drove a clinical research platform. So what we do is we ask patients to create and update their information. They do that to find support from each other because they care about each other. It's the opposite of privacy. There is no privacy, by the way. You have to give up all your data to be part of the system. You learn from aggregated reports. But the best part is, no one does any of this on their own. They take it back to their doctor in this great doctor visit sheet that just records what the patient knows about themselves. We're not talking molecular diagnostics. We're talking straightforward phenomics. You know, you go to your doctor and you say, how are you? And the, doc you know, the doctor says, looks like you're doing about how we expected. Let's stay the course. Looks like you're doing worse than we expected. Let's look what you're doing, so let's change it. Let's do it better. Well, humans are great heuristics engines. Doctors are amazing at integrating disparate data. But if you don't formalize it, you end up with all kinds of biases. My favorite is the study that showed that doctors were more influenced by the last patient they saw than the one in front of them in terms of their expected outcome. So, so you have to convert this information into numbers if you want to do good care, let alone personalized medicine. So we have evidence, we help people understand seizures, reduce side effects. This is my favorite, reduce visits to the ER. If I had a drug that reduced ER visits and epilepsy by 18%, um, I'd be sponsoring the conference. Um, because we're a kind of a dating site, what I like is that each disease has a couple people that engage to be married. I was trying to decide if I count that as a single data point or a double data point. I can also look at the side effects of engagement and then the transition to marriage. And then for the geneticists in the audience, looking at multiple patients with the same disease that get married and have kids, really interesting experiments we can do. But what we really want to do in personalized medicine is not use genomics, not use proteomics, not use the amazing technology I saw that looked at proteasome dynamics. We want to predict the future so we can change it. So here's a patient that took an experimental drug and said, let me see if it works. And so we built a model that allows us to take that patient, integrate that data, and it's matching them with 10 patients just like them, bringing their data back into one profile. It's the full integral of the curve. There's a lot of complex math here. We hired some physicists from the people that crashed Wall Street. And, and they build this tool that predicts the patient's future based on what we know about them already. And the patient died at the 75th percentile of their controls. It's pretty powerful. You go to your doctor, what's going to happen? We can Kaplan Meyer your wheelchair needs. We can Kaplan Meyer when you need a vent. We can Kaplan Meyer your death. And the patients want the information. They want it rigorously, formally, accurately. But the cool thing is, if you can do this for an individual, you can aggregate it up into a group. So remember that study I showed you at the beginning, the lithium that was so good in ALS and you wanted to be in the blue line? That's the blue line. And that's the other line. And this is what happened to the actual patients in the real world that took lithium. Nothing. And it took $25 million worth of three confirmatory studies to show that the original study was bogus. And we knew the answer a year and a half before everyone else and published it. Nature Biotechnology. 
So the question is, what are we doing here thinking about medicine? Because what I heard today is a lot of really amazing dialogue, 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 dialogue sorry, about genetics and links to disease or wafer and dosing or whatever it is. And the, and the database that Foundation Medicine is building that's beautiful and that I would tell all of my friends that had cancer to go and look at because it would look at everything we know about drugs and, 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 and the ability to mark them against genetic cancer issues. So they've gone to the next level, which is how do I integrate all of this in some array basis? And we talked about RNA and we talked about all of these different technologies. But it's still looking backwards. It's not about the dynamics of either healthcare or the system itself. So patients go through a journey. Their entire life is a vector. Their well-being and their productivity. Their DNA changes over time. RNA changes continuously. Proteins change continuously. Metabolites change continuously. And we have no understanding of the dynamics of host health or what it means at all. And we have no hope of learning it in the way we do clinical research or clinical care. We have to bring the kinds of models that it turns out patients care about into the system. And if the doctors won't fill out the forms unless we pay them, maybe the patients can demand that they do it. And if they won't do it, maybe the patients can do it themselves. Because there are people that want to know what information is necessary. What are the meaningful variables that affect my current and future health? And if you do that, you ask the patients their status, and you draw their blood, and you do all of these amazing things that we're learning are going to change the way we understand disease now. And you treat them, and you cycle this thing again and again and again in real time. I don't care about multiplex statistics. I don't care about how much you're overdriving your solving. Because when you have a hypothesis, you're testing it immediately, and you're seeing the feedback in the loop. We don't have a statistics problem. We don't have a reduction problem. We don't have a, a, a publication problem. We have a problem that we're not iteratively thinking about medicine as a learning system and putting the data in the care platform of medicine to do so. Because if we do that right, all of the algorithms, all of the integrated things that every company here is trying to build, the network, the data collection model, how I get the data, whether it's meaningful, quality control, all of those things, can be broken into component parts so that each one can deliver the best value. And somebody's computer, maybe it's Watson, can say, if you know this and you do this, not across one enterprise or one solution, but the whole thing, you'll get a better outcome and reduce pathology. And you know what? When you're wrong, you ask the patient, what was wrong? Why was this information wrong? And then the system learns. It's not about the group. It's about the the exceptions in every way that teach you something. That's why that long tail mattered so much, which we don't capture and we don't do unless we're paying someone in the system to, quote, care about the patients. So my last point that I want to make here is that we're building an information resource that determines whether people we love live or die. And we don't give it to them. If the patients don't have the power to access this data, to check our errors, check our BS, check when we're exaggerating to make our investors or the FDA or somebody happy, to really look at the fundamental level, then we won't build a system that self-corrects and learns. And we have to give the patients a part of the process. They're not subjects, they're participants, they're partners. They're partners in this enterprise. And if we do this right, Clinical research and clinical care converge, but they don't converge to serve us in, as an industry. They serve the patient that determines the values that matter in the system because they tell you what matters to them. Is it about well-being or productivity or two more months in an ICU? What do they want? I do phenomics. I love genomics. I've done it in my lab. I love all this work, but right now we don't even know what disease is. We don't know what the health is over time. We don't have an understanding of health itself at a phenomic level. What does a normal person walk like? What does a normal person live like? What's their depression level like? How do we think about normal and variance from it? And we certainly don't have the data to tell, tell any individual in the system now whether they're normal or they're not. 
And I think we have to figure out how to build all of these problems partnering with the patients to make this system work. And that's what personalized medicine is about, is giving the patients the tool to change their outcome that we've predicted effectively collaboratively. Thank you.